Hello, Cyberpunks. I'm your host, Brendan Lupus Damon Sandifer, and welcome to our Cyberpunk podcast, where we discuss various cyberpunk media. With me today, we have Barry. Hello. Greg. Hello. Graham. Hello. And Wes. Howdy. We might have Randy joining later. I don't know about Matt. Depending on um, availability. Yes. So today we are discussing When Gravity Fails, a 1986 novel by George Alec Effinger. This novel was the first of a trilogy, which would have been a series if not for Effinger's passing. Uh, it won the Nebula Award for Best Novel in 1987 and the Hugo Award for Best Novel in 1988. Uh, now we're going to discuss the setting and protagonist before we get into the plot summary. Mm. Um, Effinger's novel, set near the end of the 22nd century, describes an ascendant Arabic, uh, Arabic Muslim world where the West has been in decline for at least a century. The U.S., Europe, and Soviet Union are described as having it fractured into many small states, squabbling amongst themselves for remnants of former glory, with their citizens often describing or often described as visiting the unnamed city of the novel setting as bumbling naive tourists in awe of, or in awe at the wonders of the Muslim world. Later stories relate that the Muslim world itself is fractured politically, and that a major character in the series frequently manipulates political events in the Muslim world to enhance his own fortune and personal power. The Islamic world shows much of the elements commonly associated with it, such as religious faith, intricate rituals of conduct and relationship, and tensions between ethnic groups. This novel <clears throat> is told from the perspective of Marid Audrin, a young man from low origins, coming from the Maghreb, and being the son of a, or sorry, an Algerian prostitute and a Frenchman. Uh, Madrid is a small-scale operator and hustler in the Boudayin, the entertainment and criminal quarter of an unnamed Middle Eastern city, probably somewhere in the Levant, based on several geographical references to the other countries around the region. Uh, Audrin considers himself a freelance operator and is fiercely proud of his independence, both from others, including Friedlander, or Friedlander Bay, the uh, shadowy paternalistic crime figure overseeing most of the Budayin's business interests, and from Cyber Modification, where most others have their brain wired for work or play. Audrin's almost superstitious dread of this modification has prevented him from doing the same, and so he cannot use daddies from add-ons. Uh, software chips providing skills like languages or accounting, or modis, modules that contain the whole or contain whole new personalities. For example, those of movie stars or fictional characters. He covers this shortcoming by personal charm, a certain arrogance, and excessive use of stimulants, opiates, and other drugs to which he is effectively addicted. <laughs> Audrin's claims of independence from everyone often give in uh, given often given in wry internal narration are not fully factual either. He is very fond of many people in the Budayin, from various prostitutes, barkeepers, and other lowlifes of the ghetto, to most especially Yasmin, his on and off girlfriend. The relationship with Yasmin it trans woman now working as a rather successful prostitute is ex is especially volatile with periods of mutual understanding and love being interrupted by vicious fights between the two 
Now we're going to move into the plot, so Barry, if you have the spoiler tag ready. It's already up. Perfect. A series of brutal murders soon begins to panic the Boudin, and Audrin is almost executed by Friedlander Bay, who at first considers him to be the killer. He is then forced by the centuries-old Bay to become his investigator, and even worse, is made to subject himself to extensive partly experimental cybernetic modifications and an advanced form of the brain wiring he has dreaded before. Uh, while the killer or killers step by step and very brutally begin wiping out the witnesses as well as acquaintances of Audrin, he tries to uh, uncover clues to their nature and to the link between the seemingly unconnected victims. Meanwhile, he is fighting his fears of inadequacy in the face of a killer who obviously uses Mahdi's, making him into some of the most feared and bestial uh, serial killers of history. Most of Audrin's advances are made more by luck or intuition than natural skill or persistence. Yet, after being accosted by and subsequently overpowering the modified killer, who had begun stalking Audrin himself with sadistic glee and patience, he is not convinced that everything is over. In fact, he finds that one of the most important middlemen in the booty game was the real figure behind the murders. When he confronts him, uh, he's almost killed himself, and facing death, has to insert a special daddy, which makes him go into a bestial frenzy, killing the murderer. However, in his rage, he also slaughters a captured policeman and mutilates both bodies horribly. This gruesome nature of his self-defense disgusts his former acquaintances in the booty game. Friedlander Bay, in the final move uh, sealing Audrin's fate, then forces him into becoming one of his lieutenants, to serve as a new middleman between the ghetto and the police. As a result, he is now viewed with suspicion by everyone, and ends the novel with practically no friends, even Yasmin turning away from him. So, let's start with Barry. Barry, is it cyberpunk? Um... I mean, it sounds like it has uh, cybernetics and chipped skills, so uh, that aspect is there. Um, it, it, yeah. Did you mention mm. corporations or anything? No. Mm. Then I would say it's cyberpunk adjacent. It's more sci-fi than cyberpunk because without the corporations and the whole uh, rip the system... Uh, authority sucks. Uh, yeah, it's not quite cyberpunk, but it does sound like it has a lot of cyberpunk elements to it. Okay. Uh, Wes, you wanted to say something? Uh, I will say that it does sound cyberpunky because of the fact that it does sound, at the very least, like a cyberpunk story told from the side of the police force that are actually going after the people that are actually a danger to even the anarchists uh, that go up against the bad parts of society. So it's the, it is the, uh, it is essentially the good part of the authority going after the bad part of society essentially what police actually should do in regards to finding killers and putting them behind bars and uh, at least in at least in terms of doing their job as their job is described of you know Okay, um, I'm going to say, yes, it's cyberpunk, uh, being that 
I read off the plot and everything, or even before the plot with the setting, um, I'm willing to say it's cyberpunk because you see that political turmoil and maybe this society isn't as nice as it's claiming to be, uh, which Randy would probably say hints more towards a dystopian yeah. thing than cyberpunk, but I digress. Um, it's got the cybernetics, mm -hmm. and I mean, twenty second century, mm -hmm. you, which would be the twenty one hundreds. There'd be advancements in tech than what, especially than what the eighties had. So it even sounds like it has cyber psychos. Exactly. So I'm willing to say yes, it's cyberpunk. Mm. Um, Greg, what were your thoughts? Well, got myself muted. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that would do it. Basically, I agree. I think it's got enough elements of cyberpunk to make it that way. I found that the references of drug use and transgenders and everything like that was quite interesting for it being set in the Muslim world when they, religious wise, do not condone such things. Mm -hmm. So that I found very interesting along with the fact that they made the Western civilization out to be declining and falling and everybody in it bumbling idiots. <laughs> yeah. But also the angst that the character feels because he doesn't want to be forced into mind modifications by cyber implants. Yet in the end, he is anyhow. Very good point. Um, Grim. Is it cyberpunk? It's, I think at best you could put it as cyberpunk adjacent. Yes, there are a few aspects of cyberpunk, but it does seem more like it's a dystopian than a cyberpunk. All right. And then, did it add anything to the genre? I think... I'm going to start off here. I think it added kind of what the Muslim view on this would be. You know, we don't really see anything outside of the American, maybe like a Japanese or a English perspective every now and then. But we don't really ever get to see the Middle Eastern viewpoint for cyberpunk and you know it's kind of fun to see that for once uh barry your thoughts um to, ha to include those elements of transgender in the uh arabic community um, especially for something written in the 80s is very forward thinking and also how do you know that what happened to the big pink blob that used to be the uh, USSR isn't what's going to happen to the uh, big blue blob that's the USA in about another 30 to 50 years? It could happen, just like it happened over there. There could be yeah, se secessions and uh, maybe another civil war. And, I mean, there's enough stupidity and infighting and arrogance in the U.S. Right, that, but we're not getting into that right now. I know, I know. I'm just saying that um, it is a possibility. And as far as this goes, for that to be accurate, it very well could be. We don't know. We still have... Uh, a good, uh, this is the 21st century, so that was 22nd century. We've got a good hundred years before we're in the, at the end of the first fifth of the 22nd century. And that's only a hundred years. We got another, uh, 50 years. We're still not out of the 22nd century yet after that. So, yeah, yep. it's entirely possible. Um, and the other thing is, um, these... Uh, chips and mods and cyber psychos and all that other stuff. When was that first introduced to cyberpunk? Because if that had not been introduced by the time this was published, 
I'd wager that this could very well have added that to Cyberpunk, even if the and uh, the answer to the question of is it Cyberpunk is still up for debate. Yeah, I'm I'm not entirely sure on when chips and things were added to um, Cyberpunk, but as we continue this podcast, we might find out and do a revision. Mm-hmm. Or a revisited episode. Yeah. Um. Now let's go with uh. I see Wes is deafened, so we're gonna go to Greg. If Greg is listening, or on, I, he is muted. I know he's muted, but he might have walked away for a moment. All right, we're gonna move. Oh, up. no, Greg already gave, and Greg already gave his opinion a minute ago <laughs> on what it added. Oh, on what it added? Huh? Yes, different question. Excuse me. Sorry. <laughs> well, um, outside of transgenders and drug use, I'm not real sure if it added anything. The Muslim well, world. I was going to say, it really didn't add transgendered people. Well, it might have added transgendered people to cyberpunk. I'm not sure if that was covered in a adaptation well, before this I book came out. The book was 86. Yeah. So cyberpunk was still rather new at that point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't Being believe it was ever Kim- covered in Blade Runner or, or Akira. <laughs> no, the prostitution was, but not, yeah. and Blade Runner, but not, not transgender. transgender. No, um, which is, as Barry said, very forward thinking. Mm-hmm. Um, it may have added the cyber, uh, the mental cyber uh, modifications. Although I think, truthfully, Blade Runner may have touched on that a little bit too. There, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of work between these around this time that kind of has elements of that, so it's a little hard to say. And we well, you know for sure Ghost in the Shell danced all over all of that. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, Graham, your thoughts? You're also muted. I know. Uh, so, like you said, I believe it did give uh, the Middle Eastern perspective-ish on uh, the cyberpunk world. Um, I'm sure people from the Middle East would disagree with that, but... Uh, <laughs> as it stands... Uh, um, just from my what little I know, it they would have had to uh, change some stuff in order to fit the description, Middle Eastern culture wise, of what's in this. But I think that is. Uh, I think that's really the only thing it added, not necessarily anything to the world of cyberpunk other than that. All right. And Wes, your thoughts on what it added to cyberpunk? He's still yeah, deafened. He oh, he redefined himself. Oh. All right. So I'm just going to look something up here real quick before we wrap up because I want to. Actually, See, I've exactly. got another side comment. So, oh, well, uh, for something published in the 80s, that's one thing. But for anything um, published at least in the past five years, anything that doesn't, you know, at least have a nod to someone transgender is kind of either um, a backwards thinking work in the first place or it's set to be classical, like, for more than five years ago because... That whole mentality is so mainstream nowadays that there's hardly any escaping it. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm just saying that uh, it's 
if somebody wants to identify as that nowadays, there's hardly any obstacle for them aside from the closed minded and the bigoted. Because right. uh, like general mainstream social media, it's everywhere. Again, trying to avoid getting into our own political beliefs on this topic or on any topic. Um, mm-hmm. But I just looked it up. Uh, so George Alec Effinger was an American right. sci-fi author. So he, he, even more so being set in the Middle East is surprising. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, th- those are our thoughts. If you guys have anything that you feel, you know, you want to add to this conversation, please leave them in the comments below. Mm-hmm. And um, if you also have any suggestions for other works that you might want us to cover, because we read the comments, we listen to your suggestions, or at least... We uh, will listen to them even if we decide not to uh, actually do what you suggest. But we will at least consider them. Right. And with that, Barry, where can we find you? If you want more of my idiocy and antics and uh, occasional ranting, you can find me at KHZHAK on YouTube, Twitch, and Twitter. I don't make much content myself, but if you look at the related channels on YouTube and who I'm hosting on Twitch, then you can find things where either I'm friends with them or I'm directly involved to some capacity. Uh, Like, for instance, one of the related channels is the channel this is being uploaded to the day after we record this. Or, actually, immediately. It just won't be available to listen to for about a day. Because I schedule it for noon on Saturdays, usually. Um, And if you uh, follow me on Twitter, most of the stuff I like and retweet is safe for work. But my pins tweet is not, because it links to a D&D game I do with some of my friends. And uh, there's random moments during the filming of that D&D where... Uh, clothing is not completely covering some of the participants. So, yes. Other than that, who's next? Uh, how about Greg? You always catch me when I'm about ready to take a bite of something. <laughs> <laughs> Impeccable timing. Yes. Um, you can catch me on my YouTube feeds, which are the links are listed on this site. And usually at the local bar somewhere near you. (laughs) All right. Uh, So for the rest of our group, and well, for this podcast specifically, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Twitch by searching Gen Cyberpunk Pod. And our YouTube channel is Generation Cyberpunk. Of course, if you're watching this on YouTube, you already knew that. If you want to hear more from our group, please check out the Thanks for Nothing podcast on the FML Productions YouTube channel. We do various D&D campaigns on that channel and are in the process of making an anime. If you want to donate, we have a coffee link in the description of our Thanks for Nothing podcast. Donations are welcome, but by no means necessary. Next week, we will cover the movie Max Headroom. Until then... We will see you later, cyberpunks.